Hello, my name is John F. Dean and um, I want to introduce to you my new and selected poems coming from the wonderful Carcanet Press. I'm also here in the county Leitrim in the Midwest of Ireland, um, where I do a lot of the writing of my poems. Um, and I want to show you, though it's not a great day, I want to show you part of the kind of countryside in which I'm living. It's quite pretty, um, very rural, a lot of trees, a lot of lakes, uh, a lot of flowers, a lot of bird song. Let me start by an introductory poem. These are all from the selected and new poems coming from Carcanet. Under the trees, the fireflies zip and go out like galaxies. Our best poems, reaching in from the periphery, are love poems, achieving calm. On the road, the cries of a broken rabbit were pitched high and they're unknowing. Our vehicles grind the creatures down, till the child's tears are for all of us dearly beloved, ageing into pain, and for herself, for what she has discovered early, beyond this world's loveliness. Always, after the agitated moments, the search for calm. Curlews scatter now on a winter field, their calls small alleluias of survival. I offer you poems. Here, where there is suffering and joy, evening and morning, the first day. So I offer poems where there is suffering and joy, this wonderful earth, this changeling and challenging humanity. After about 50 years working at poems, the putting together of a selection has offered several challenges, two central ones. Firstly, it is necessary to discover which of the poems still speak to me, still, if you like, answer me back, still resonate with the freshness that they had, for me at least, in the beginning. And secondly, a selected helps you to seek out the thread that runs through all of the poems and see does that thread actually speak back to you about your life and how it reflects that life. Then you can fix the poems if they need fixing, and many of them do, uh, some of them don't. And if they need fixing, that helps you go back over your life, trying, if you like, to see if things have gone wrong here, there, or wherever. So, in the selected poems, I have also found some poems that I do not need fixing. The life too, will have to stand as it is. I can't go back and refix all of that. Making this video, um, I am doing it on a shoestring. Uh, it's on a laptop. And please forgive me if I move around a little bit and change the focus just to show you where I am and to uh, give a little bit of difference to the background of this. So uh, bear with me for the moment, and I'm just going to change where I am. Okay, so I have just moved down the front of the house a little bit, down to the gate that leads out onto the road here. Um, this gate behind me, I call it, it is red, I call it the red gate, features a great deal in many of the poems and symbolizes, I suppose, morning, evening, opening the gate, closing the gate, life, death, all of that. So bear with me and I'm going to start by opening the gate. Morning time.
Okay. And the poem that goes with that is simply called The Red Gate. Mornings, when you swing open the red gate, admitting the world again with its creeds and wars, the hinges sing their three sharp notes of protest. You hear the poplars in their murmurings and sifflings, while the labouring high caravans of the rain pass slowly by. It will seem as if the old certainties of the moon and stars mingled with the turnings and returnings of your dreams, missed to unreality, although there rise about you matins and lauds of the meadowsweet and rowan. The first truck goes rattling down the wet road, and the raw arguments, the self-betrayed economies of governments assault you, so that you may miss the clear-souled drops on the topmost bar that would whisper you peace. Now the gate is open, the poems are beginning, and I'm going to go back to where I was. So bear with me again, please, just for a moment. Okay, I'm back up uh, near the house. I was not born here in County Leitrim. I was born on Ackle Island, an island off the west coast of Ireland. It's a wild, bewildering and dangerous place. Very beautiful, with its mountains, the Atlantic Ocean, long and unspoiled beaches. There was a dark background to life on that island. The demands of a wild ocean at your gate, the negative trust of the ancient notions, the very old notions we had, of God and self. The landscape, the skyscape, the seascape, all of it entered my soul and stayed, linking my being with the wonders of creation. The old God, too, of judgment, guilt, penance and self-denial entered into my soul, because that negative faith was all around me, like the rains sometimes like sunshine. All of this you can see, partly, in the very recent film by Martin McDonough with Brendan Gleeson and Colin Farrell called The Banshees of Er Inish Aaron. That was my island. That was my wonder. That was the type of my darkness. A little poem comes from that called Walking the Roads. Or I could, perhaps, spend all there is of afterlife, walking the road between Duoch village and the beach at Kim, flexing the spirit muscles, strengthening the spirit bones. Sometimes a telephone pole blown over in a force ten will lie down across the path, communication wires from the island to the raucous world tangled like fishing gut. Here I have most nearly found the source of the being of Ireland, my soil, my sky, my sea, my hereness. I have learned the thousand words that said Amen to the thousand weathers I had grown familiar with, learned to hold my breath when witnessing the rare, serene light shining over the bay, the sea a delicate shamrock green, translucent, and the waves fingering the slow notes of a Schubert lullaby on Keel Strand. So an instinctive oneness with nature, with creation, dominated my youth, and alongside all of that, faith and beliefs became one of my essential studies. I found under the influence of such poets as George Herbert, Gerard Manley Hopkins, Seamus Heaney, that I could work on my ideas, working them out by using poetry. That's what I mean about the poems actually speaking back to me. The faith is profound and takes many forms in different countries for different people, but that the beliefs 
the beliefs that often go with that faith are often little more than props, appurtenances, rules and regulations. Faith, a mountain. Beliefs, the stones and rocks that cover its surface. The pilgrim mountain, Crow Patrick, rose into the sky, pyramidal, often visible from almost every corner of the island. Dominant, beautiful, sometimes threatening. Penance. They leave their shoes, like signatures, below. Above, their god is waiting. Slowly they rise along the mountainside, where rains and winds go, hissing, slithering across. They are hauling up the bits and pieces of their lives, infractions of the petty laws, the little trespasses and sad transgressions. But this bulked mountain is not disturbed by their passing by this mere trafficking of shale, shifting of its smaller stones. When they come down, feet blistered and sins fretted away, their guilt remains, and that black mountain stands against darkness above them. The search for truth, call it God, call it Allah, call it Jehovah, call it love. For many years I was studying music, piano and church organ, for I did spend almost five years in a seminary aiming for the priesthood. Music, too, in its varied forms, took a firm hold of my being, shivering me through with delight. Um, I was privileged to be in a seminary with an enormous organ, and I was allowed to play and practice on that organ while the church was empty occasionally, and it gave me a wonderful delight. Here's a poem coming from that called Viola d'Amore. I had been playing Bach on the great organ. A mighty fortress is our God. The church below me, empty in the nowhere afternoon, Bombard, clarion, celeste. And when I lifted fingers from the keys, it was, for a moment, eternity. And the walls of the world contained nothing but the lingering breath of the harmony. Rafters of the loft lifted, while the whole sky trembled in a breeze that rippled slow across it, till all I knew was the touch of the fingers of Jesus, consciously drawing my breath, my bones confusing their earthly wake, and my soul ringing with immortality. I come to uh, a different kind of poem, and I'm going to read that uh, in a different context. Okay. I'm inside the house. As I try to make sense of my love of creation, of my deep need for some faith to hold on to, I began to let go of individual beliefs, the appurtenances of faith, and held on for a while, almost with the dread of losing everything, to the richly human, kindly, loving and healing person of Jesus, the Christ, the incarnation the insistence on the humanity of Jesus, the real flesh and bones that knew joy and pain as we do. I think that after all the years of searching, there is a phrase I use in one of the poems that almost sums it up. The helplessness, excuse me, the helplessness of God trusting himself to flesh. The focal poem in this context is based on seeing a crucifix that portrays Jesus in all his actual agonies, while hearing of the Grenfell Tower, that tragedy in London in June of 2017. I had to face the problem of great suffering in our world, knowing there is no real answer to that problem, not any real consolation, save perhaps knowing that the Christ knew and shared in this 
ever-present suffering. Naming of the Bones, London, June 2017. I looked up and saw you, your distorted body, rising again in agony. There is a season, the big book says, a time to die, a time to weep, and a time for peace. No one, it says, can understand what is happening under the sun. I saw the bare breast heaving, that once beautiful breast. I hurt for you, for your beloved once beautiful body. Each twist or twitch, each reach and wrench adds to the fire in your flesh. I plead to Creator God for you, to ease your pain, to mother you. I wince once more at the bitter apple angers of humankind, the blunted iron nails driven through your caring hands, your tender feet, so that, impossible, you hang from them, you stand on them, the muscles cramp and spasm, and your face, so beautiful once, is contorted with spit and ugliness, with blood and sweat and tears. Today, my Christ, June 14, 2017, Grenfell Tower in London was engulfed in flames, inestimable furnace, suffering unbearable. A child appears for a moment at a window of the 16th floor, a moment only, frantic, waving. To who? To you not there? We hurt, my Christ, we hurt. Why is our spittle hot with bitterness? Words, the big book says, can be wearisome, a chasing after wind, and yet the world breaks, the world reforms, but the beautiful body breaks and yields, yearning and grief trouble us. At the heart of it, you hurting. Now again, I want to lighten myself and the mood of the poems. So I'm going to go back outdoors. Please again, bear with me. Okay, here I am again. This is the front of the house in County Leitrim. Um, I've already spoken about the influence that music has had on me uh, down through the years. In the new and selected poems, there is a long sequence of poems based on the notion of the visions of a man. The sequence is called Like the Dewfall. The French composer Olivier Messiaen wrote a suite of seven pieces for two pianos, composed and performed in 1943 during the Nazi occupation in Paris. He called the suite Vision de la Main, Visions of the Amen. Messiaen describes the music as seven visions reflecting the lives of those who say Amen, accepting the details of their existence with gratitude. So for me, the poems are guided by the titles of Messiaen's pieces. And I'm going to read the first of these poems. I am a young boy at home on Ackel Island, beginning to come to terms with the details of my own existence. So it is called A Boy Child, A Man of Creation. There is a boy urging a child-sized US Army Jeep around a dew-damp Ackel Island yard, pedaling and steering and the small stones bump the khaki green star marked plaything. A cockerel scolds loudly as he cock steps along the wall. Battle and standoff between cockerel and boy being everyday events of moment. Distant, familiar and unfamiliar that child, there where the pine tree grove was bounded by flowering escalonia bushes, where robin, thrush and blackbird sang, where the angelus bell tolled over 
the incarnation. Noon, he is in the parlour at the piano, much against his will, battling the scales, the fingering, the sharps, the flats. Tempo, time, time, the music mother calls. On the lacquered lid, the tick-tock tick of the metronome, while the world turns outside and the fuchsia is in bloom. Adagio cantabile, softly, softly. But from this time out it will all be crescendo, allegretto, and yet a man to the music, and a man to the universe, from cockerel to humpback whale, from quark to galaxy, a man to the Christ child, chortling in the crib, new earth, heart of creation, who is, who was, who is coming to be, to sustained harmony of the spheres. Amen. Pianissimo. Begin. Let me just mention for a moment the notion of poetry as being religious poems. That has become a negative term at this stage, and I find that very, very sad. Religion has come to mean the assent, if you like, to dogma and to rituals and rites. But the original sense of the word religion means to tie things together, to gather what you can of the universe and try and make some sort of sense of it. So my poems are religious in the sense that they try and touch the transcendent by gathering together the experiences of the real, the everyday and the material world. I concur with the sentiment of the paleontologist and theologian Teilhard de Chardin, who wrote in an essay titled How I Believe. He wrote, To my mind, the religious phenomenon taken as a whole is simply the reaction of the universe as such, of collective consciousness and human action in process of development. And I would wish that people would read the poems for their music, their imagery, their journey through the very real world in all its light and darkness. Poems on a mission to understand creation and to seek the transcendent through living the actual, contemporary, difficult world. Okay, just one last move again. Please give me a moment. Okay, I am back down at the gate, the gate that I opened earlier on. And I'll read, if I may, just one more poem, also uh, in the selected and new poems due from the Carcanet Press. So I opened the gate early on, and now I'm going to close it and read a poem that goes with the closing of the gate, uh, if you like, an, a nighttime poem, an evening poem as well. And I hope it's uh, a positive, joyful poem. This poem is called Canticle. Sometimes when you walk down to the red gate, hearing the scrape music of your shoes across gravel, a yellow moon will lift over the hill. You swing the gate shut and lean on the topmost bar as if something has been accomplished in the world. A night wind missiles through the poplar leaves, and all the noise of the universe stills to an oboe hum, the given note of a perfect music. There is a vast sky 
wholly dedicated to the stars, and you know with certainty that all the dead are out up there in one holiday flotilla, and that they celebrate the fact of a red gate and a yellow moon that tunes their instruments with you to the symphony. <laughs>